Headquarters was in Detroit. Uh, interestingly enough, we'll talk about it uh, in a little bit. But uh, one of the people that was really instrumental in getting the Great Lakes firmly mapped out with good quality maps was uh, General George Meade, who was the same George Meade who defeated Lee at the Battle of Gettysburg. So um, his headquarters was in Detroit for a number of years prior to the uh, prior to the Civil War. A uh, little side note, uh, uh, Ulysses Grant was also assigned to Detroit about the same time. He had nothing to do, he was strictly uh, uh, an army officer assigned to um, the fort that existed before Fort Wayne that escaped, but the name escapes me just for a moment. But uh, so both uh, General Meade and General Grant were here as young officers at the same time 
uh, prior to the Civil War. So uh, we're at NAF for the Motor City, uh, the South Dakota one, and uh, we're always speaking with plug accents right now. That, that's a joke, you can laugh if you want. <laughs> um, Anyhow, um, so you can see uh, some of the other activities uh, that happened. Uh, 1876 is really the bellwether year for uh, for, the, for what is now known as the Coast Guard in Detroit. Uh, Detroit's established as a headquarters for the U.S. Life Saving Service. Uh, so it's the Great Lakes headquarters. And the facility that's at Mount Elliott, uh, which is now the Coast Guard sector there, uh, the first facility was built in 1876. They've been operating there ever since. And then in 1881, the station out on uh, Belle Isle opens. I don't know how to research this, but I'm 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 guessing, and, and you Coast Guard folks, but I I can't think there's probably too many cities in America where there's two um, Coast Guard facilities in the same city. I mean, probably New York City, probably probably Los Angeles, um, but I would have to think that makes us a relative rarity, and it certainly makes us a rarity on the Great Lakes to have two facilities. Uh, inside the same municipality. Um, and we'll talk a little bit um, about uh, the Detroit Marine Hospital, which opened in 1854 and operated through 1927. And that was a facility both for, um, both for uh, uh, private sailors that, that worked on, uh, on freighters or uh, private shipping, uh, as well as government service sailors. And really it was a hospital that was a forerunner to what is now the Dingle Hospital in, in downtown Detroit, part of the VA Center. Um, and at the time, when it opened in 1854, uh, every sailor who was uh, operated on the Great Lakes had to pay 40 cents a year to uh, help maintain that hospital. So, talk about inflation, your health insurance costs 40 what cents a year. What was the original location? Um, it's right across the street from the uh, sector, uh, from the Coast Guard sector downtown. Or uh, on uh, on Mount Elliott and Jefferson. Okay. Yep. Um, and then in, uh, in the mid '60s, the uh, air station in Detroit is established. Uh, at at Selfridge, it's been uh, been there ever since. Um, and you can see a few other dates there as well. Uh, this is a this is a picture of the original uh, Belle Isle station. Um, it was originally uh, a life-saving uh, station and, and a lighthouse. You can see uh, the light, the light here <coughs> on the side, and then there were uh, folks there with uh, boats that could go off uh, into the surf and uh, save lives as necessary. And, uh, that property was purchased from the city um, for a dollar in uh, 1881. So it's, it's one of the oldest stations on the Great Lakes. And that's in the same location where the uh, where the existing facility is. Uh, this is the uh, revenue cutter Porcupine. Uh, that's the ship that arrived here, as I said, in 1819. Um, it had been in the U.S. fleet in the Battle of Lake Erie and the War of 1812. Um, it was uh, there was a pretty significant uh, war or battle uh, during the War of 1812 between the British from Canada and the Americans uh, trying to decide who would control the Great Lakes. It's really the most significant battle that ever took place, and really arguably the only significant battle that ever took place in the Great Lakes. Um, uh, the Americans won that war, and that was really a, a, a turning point to the Americans being able to control the upper Midwest uh, in the War of 1812. So uh, in 1814, the porcupine is assigned uh, to Detroit. Uh, this is a uh, this uh, schematic here is in Erie, Pennsylvania. There's a uh, restoration group that uh, built a copy of the porcupine. There is no uh, there's no photos that I can find of the original ship. Um, and then it operated as a revenue cutter, so it was out basically collecting taxes on the uh, on the Upper Great Lakes. Uh, until 1825, and then it went into uh, private service. The government decommissioned it, sold it to a private firm. Uh, and then it was uh, um, on a, on a, uh, in a dock in Spring Lake, Michigan, which is on the west side of the state in Lake Michigan, and it sank at the docks in 1843, so about, uh, about 20 years before the Civil War. Uh, this is the only ship, uh, as mentioned there, this is the only ship that was ever assigned to Detroit that was in government service. It didn't have a motor, so kind of interesting to you know to think about it. I can't even imagine how they uh, were able to uh, 
uh, controllable shifts and docking and those kind of things without, without the benefit of an engine. Um, also, this ship would not have been able to go into Lake Superior um, because this was uh, prior to the suit locks being built. Uh, the next uh, ship that showed up um, it was part of the uh, U.S. Revenue Cutter Service. Um, was the USS Michigan. It was never actually uh, based in Michigan. It was based out of Erie, Pennsylvania, but it was uh, the, the primary ship, and for a lot of years, the only ship in what was known as the Great Lakes Patrol um, that operated um, 1843 uh, until the early 1900s. Um, it was uh, an iron hulled ship. It was one of the uh, first iron hulled ships that was operated by the Navy and then was uh, transferred into the, into the Revenue Cutter Service, which was one of the uh, predecessors of the Coast Guard. Most of you guys probably know more about that than I do. Um, an interesting little side note with this, uh, with this ship, there's a couple of interesting side notes. In uh, Northern Lake Michigan uh, on Beaver Island, which is the largest island in Lake Michigan, um, there was a gentleman by the name of James Jesse Strang, and he, uh, when uh, Joseph Smith, Joseph Smith was the founder of uh, what we refer to today as the Mormon Church, uh, when he died there was some uh, conflict over how the uh, Mormon Church, who would be the new leader of the Mormon Church, and eventually Brigham Young became the leader, and he went west and eventually ended up out in Utah, uh, and this Je James Jesse Strang was a was kind of in competition with them. He ended up through a series of maneuvers, ended up on Beaver Island, where he established himself as the king of Beaver Island, and he uh, established a, a kingdom. And it's the, the only case where somebody established a kingdom in the continental United States. And basically, the U.S. kind of looked the other way and said, "Yeah, you know." You're up there in remote, remote, far northern Michigan. You're on an island. Knock yourself out. Be a kingdom. Um, and and uh, really, the U.S. government really didn't care all that much about what was going on up there until essentially there started to be a civil war in this kingdom, and uh, the king was assassinated. And uh, just so happens that when he was assassinated, the uh, Michigan had been sent there to. Uh, uh, to try and kind of keep the peace, try to solve the Civil War. So I was there uh, present for uh, for that assassination of the king. Probably one of the only uh, Coast Guard vessels ever been present for a king's assassination. Would he have some kind of cult up there or something? Uh, I, I don't know if you'd call it a cult or not. I mean, it was uh, it was his own version of you know the Latter Day Saints movement. Um, you know, really, I think it was really just a power struggle of who was going to be in charge of it, um, and then. Uh, you know, he went up there, like I said, just kind of established the kingdom. Um, kind of crazy. Uh, this was the, uh, the first ship that, that ever served in military service called the Michigan. Uh, there have been uh, five Michigans since then. There's a current Michigan that's uh, now a, um, uh, it's a ballistic missile submarine that's operated by, by the U.S. Navy. Uh, this ship was uh, commissioned, as you can see, in 1912. Back, back in the day, um, there were a number of uh, state naval militias, which was kind of like the National Guard, only kind of the Navy National Guard. Uh, Michigan had its own naval militia that, um, that existed for uh, about, about 15, 20 years um, in the late 1800s, early 1900s, before the Navy Reserve really kind of uh, was established. So this ship was used by the Pennsylvania Naval Militia, uh, still based there in Erie, Pennsylvania until 1925. So obviously you can see this uh, ship had both uh, sails uh, and, the smoke and the smokestack here. So that was, that was the law on the high seas of the Great Lakes uh, for most of the 19th century. Did the Navy donate that to the militia or how did they get that? They, you know, they, um, probably very similar to what the, the relationship now between the state National Guard and the, and the military, they probably just signed it over to them. Uh, that's kind of similar, just, just a side note, it's kind of similar to how things work now. So as the Michigan Air National Guard, the airplanes that we fly are actually owned by the Air Force. Um, and, and the people who fly them, some days are owned by the state, some days are owned by the federal government. 
and in, uh, in another 20 years, when I understand how it works, I will come and explain it to you. But, but, yeah. but. All right, uh, this is uh, Captain William G. Williams. Uh, he was the founder of the Lake Survey. Uh, he established it in 1839, uh, and his his issue was there weren't good maps of the Great Lakes, so it was time. Uh, it was time to you know to start making these good maps. America was expanding to the west, um, and it was time to have uh, good quality maps of the Upper Great Lakes. Um, I, I, I mostly uh, through this. You know, I'm fascinated by uh, some of these uh, folks that uh, exist that operated at the time. Some of their backgrounds are just fascinating to me. Um, and this guy's big uh, claim to fame, as you can see here, he led a storming party, which, I don't know, that sounds pretty impressive to me. He led a storming, par a storming party to take Monterey, Mexico in the Mexican-American War. So after he served on the Lake Survey, he went back into uh, regular Army service and, uh, and was down there in the Mexican-American War, which is uh, where most of the um, significant leaders in the Civil War learned how to uh, perform military operations. Took place in the 1840s. <clears throat> okay, I mentioned uh, General George G. Meade, um, who was assigned to uh, headquarter of the Lake Survey, which was very closely related with the Revenue Cutter Survey, uh, with the Revenue Cutter Service that operated in Detroit at the time. Uh, General Meade was here from 1857 until 1861 when he went into. Uh, he went back into the regular army to be a part of the Civil War. Uh, so his uh, big claim to fame was uh, completing the first detailed survey of all five Great Lakes that was published in a single publication. So um, you know, for those of you that, that work uh, on the waterways, you know, having good maps is, is important. And uh, of course, I've been on the ships where they have all the maps from the drawers, and he was the guy that made the first maps from the drawers work. Um, he also uh, briefly was in charge of the uh, Lighthouse District in Detroit. So all these things kind of uh, operated somewhat independently, but, uh, but somewhat uh, uh, together. Uh, it was really the Army that was kind of in charge of a lot of this stuff that took place on the land and, and, and still is to a certain point. When the Lake Survey was, um, uh, the Lake Survey was essentially deemed complete in the in the late 1880s. Um, it continued to exist for a little while, and now it's uh, part of the U.S. Geological Survey, which exists in the National Oceanic Atmospheric Bat Outfit Administration. Um, the Lake Survey is one of the few instances of a government agency that uh, completed its job and then went away. Usually government agencies never go away. There's people working there, and they they won't let it happen. Um, so it's kind of an un interesting, and unusual, uh, unusual case. Okay, uh, this is a picture of the Detroit Lighthouse Depot, which was built in 1871. Um, it existed um, uh, for uh, well for more than 100 years now because the the, uh, the the basics of the structure continues to exist. Um, so basically, this was the storehouse for all uh, lighthouses that existed on the Great Lakes. Uh, Detroit was the central hub, so if you needed a new uh, uh, new lens, uh, whatever it was that you needed uh, to operate a lighthouse on the Great Lakes, this Detroit was the central repository for all that stuff. Um, I think I have yes. So this is the building as it exists today. Um, you can see. You, if you look close, it's pretty much the uh, pretty much the same thing there. Mm -hmm. Not much has changed. It's actually in pretty remarkable condition. That picture is probably um, less than five years old. Um, I have no idea what it looks like on the inside, but uh, I don't know if anybody, it's a good. Yeah, good thing. We're trying to trying to buy it back from the city right now. Oh really? Oh, that would be and the best thing that could happen to still it. Still in good shape. We want to put it back into use. Oh, that that would be that would be awesome. The um, just a little side note: the Broadhead Naval Armory, which is uh, kind of unrelated to any of this, but the Broadhead Naval Armory on Jefferson 
Uh, it's right next to the UAW, so where is it? Uh, Van Lake, I think? Grand Boulevard. Uh, Grand Boulevard. Grand Boulevard? Okay. Yeah, that, I was just talking to a guy, I was just talking to a guy that was in there um, a few weeks ago, and he said it was just trash on the inside. Just completely uh, demolished. If you've been in there, you know all those Art Deco murals and stuff. I mean, it's, it used to be beautiful. I was in there probably 10, 12, well, I was in there before the Marine Corps left. Um, where is this one? This, this is also right across the street from the sector office, right? So it's across, what? I don't know. It's yeah. across Mount Elliot from the sector office, yeah. So, so it's north of, from the north side? Yeah. Mount River. Mount River the sector. Oh, yeah, north side of the sector, right outside of the sector gate. Mm -hmm. yeah. Oh, yeah, okay. Head towards the city. Mm -hmm. yeah. it, it'd be, it would be, um, It'd be a godsend to the preservation of this building if the federal government got uh, got its hands on it because that would be that would be very positive. Um, this is a picture of the uh, of the Detroit Marine Hospital. Uh, as as mentioned, it started in uh, in the 1840s uh, and continued until the uh, 1920s when its uh, function was taken over by the VA. Uh, but you can see here in the 1880s, it was a pretty busy place. They had 320 uh, patients that, that stayed uh, at least one overnight uh, in that facility. Now, I'm trying to figure out, because I, I found this picture. Um, this picture came from uh, the Detroit Public Library, from a book that they had. Um, and, as I look at, and as I look at this picture, and then I look at this picture, I'm, I'm wondering, if the Detroit Marine Hospital and the Lighthouse Depot were the same building, or part of the same building. No, you're saying no? Good day. No. And the reason, and I didn't think that because, I, I mean, this building was, was built at a different time, but, but when I look at this center structure, I don't know, I was kind of, oops. I was flipping back and forth the other night trying to really figure it out, but they're different buildings. Okay, that's why I thought, but I wasn't sure. When I see that, I think of like the Riverview Hospital or whatever. Um, yeah. There's some buildings right along that park. Sounds like the captain has knowledge. Do you, do you know? I, mean, I was just saying if it truly was at Mount Allen and Jefferson, it'd be where the current ICE building is up the road from Big yeah, no, yeah. Well, this I mean, according according to uh, the book I found from the Detroit Public Library, which was uh, written in uh, I want to say the 1880s, um, it was at Mount Elliott and Jefferson. So that's why I was wondering if this building, I don't know, they sure look very similar to me. One looks, yeah, anyway, they look different but similar. Anyhow. Um, so uh, the next uh, the next uh, ship. To arrive is this guy, the lighthouse tender Warrington. So basically, um, he was assigned to Detroit, or she was assigned to Detroit, and, and really would, would come to Detroit, go to the lighthouse depot, uh, pick up all the supplies, and then go to all the lighthouses all around the Great Lakes. Uh, did that for about 25 years, uh, 20 years, before running aground near Charlotte Point. And you can see, uh, still, still a mass, uh, still using a mass and uh, steam power. A couple of a uh, couple of old photos uh, stolen from the uh, Coast Guard uh, website. Uh, this is the uh, sector Detroit under under uh, reconstruction in 1912. Uh, the original facility opened in 1876. This is the 1912, and then there was a 1980s, I want to say, uh, major overhaul. So, old government buildings last forever. In this, in this photo at the top, it, it's kind of hard to see it, but the Lighthouse Depot is that kind of blob up at the top there. Um, it's a little bit easier to see when it's not on the screen. What direction is that going? The left the left. Looking north. Water in, I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think. That would be north. Yeah. Yeah. From the lake looking in. Yeah, you're. This is so you're out. So this top picture, you're out in the water, mm -hmm. looking north, correct? So that's Jefferson yeah. way in the back. 
Right. Yeah. So yeah. That's yeah. The building. Yeah. Could that be the hospital? Yeah. Right? So yeah. the, on the uh, mm -hmm. on the yeah. right building, yeah. straight through if you follow. That yeah. Path. The negative is backwards. Mm -hmm. You think so? I don't know. I pulled it right off the uh, Coast Guard website as is. But what I'm saying is, if it was transferred from a negative, a lot of the negatives were reversed backwards. Yeah. So the right side would be downstream. Oh. Which makes more sense the way it's laying out. Mm. Because the White House building could be to the right because it's actually downstream of the sector. Gotcha. And they, they have never moved the downstream wall of Sector Detroit property line. There's a guy named Ben Gravel, I have to give him a call. He's an architect. Okay. Guru <coughs> in the Detroit area. He would be the guy to know. Yeah. It is it is hard to come by some of these old photos and sometimes they have good descriptions and sometimes they don't. Uh, these ones do not. Yeah, and he went over there? You ever been back there? Yes, but I'm not a guy that can, I, I don't have that spatial ability. You know, down the street, there's that uh, threat management uh, company. There's, uh, no, that, I, I don't know. It looks like an old, like old government hangar or something. I wonder if that is Okay, uh, through this uh, through this guy in through through him in just today. Uh, this is the uh, the largest ship that's uh, stationed here now, and I wanted a picture of uh, lots of snow and ice in honor of today's uh, today, today's weather. Um, so this is a, a picture of uh, Bristol Bay, uh, which is downtown. Um, and we'll come back to him in a minute. Okay, uh, back to. Uh, Back to, uh, this is a slightly, actually it's the same picture of, uh, of Belle Isle. Uh, the existing facility was built in 1942 uh, on the same facility uh, that's there now. Okay, nice picture of uh, St. Clair Shores, which is actually one of the youngest uh, facilities on the Great Lakes. Uh, opened in uh, 1954. Uh, replaced a facility that had been on uh, Harsons Island, I believe. Um, obviously you can see that. Uh, I don't, my mother's in the room, so I won't tell you the story about the time when I skipped school one day when I was a senior in high school and there was an admiral visiting the Coast Guard station in, in uh, St. Clair Shores and we got boarded by the ship with the admiral on it. And, uh, my buddy got in a lot of trouble, but it wasn't my boat, so I didn't really care. So, <laughs> um, but that was a long time ago. But since my mom's here, I'm going to tell that story. <laughs> Yeah, too late. Yeah, too late. Uh, this is a uh, this is our uh, picture of our uh, of our team up at uh, up at Selfridge, uh, one of two air stations that operate on the Great Lakes. The others in Traverse City. So these guys uh, cover roughly the eastern half of the uh, Great Lakes basin. Uh, about 100, 125 people assigned um, with the uh, with the helicopters there. Um, my memory serves um, about 30 uh, lives saved in a typical year, 30, 35, sounds about right, those car guys? Yeah, okay. Um, so a typical year um, takes place there. They've been, they've been there uh, been there ever since. Um, it was their original location. So. Uh, and as I mentioned, I'm an Air Force guy, so uh, I found this picture of the Coast Guard helicopter, one of our uh, A-10 attack planes at Selfridge. So this is just a gratuitous photo of an Air Force uh, attack aircraft. So you can pull it later if you want. That's good. Oh, uh, okay, there's, uh, there's a picture of some folks doing some training uh, out on Lake St. Clair uh, on a uh, cold, snowy day. A couple of years ago, uh, the uh, facility, the hangar at uh, Coast Guard Station uh, at St. Clair Shores, is named for Jack. Uh, I think that I think actually his name is spelled incorrectly on this on the slide. I, I believe it's pronounced Rashir. Um, anyhow, he was a uh, Coast Guard uh, pilot who was uh, killed in the line of duty as a pilot in the Vietnam War. Um, it was the only Coast Guard pilot that was killed um, in the line of duty in Vietnam. 
he uh, uh, kind of an unusual background in that he was in the Air Force, uh, then got out of the Air Force and joined the Coast Guard as a pilot, uh, and then was on an exchange program back into the Air Force uh, to serve in Vietnam. So it was uh, a little bit of an unusual uh, uh, career path there, but um, you can see some of the uh, you can see some of the some of the numbers. Uh, five of uh, the HH-65 helicopters assigned. It's really it's only the second aircraft, second aircraft type that's been assigned to uh, assigned to Selfridge for the Coast Guard. Uh, they had uh, an earlier iteration of rescue helicopters there that uh, changed out in uh, I must say the late 70s, early 80s. Uh, there was some talk of the Coast Guard getting uh, some C-130. Uh, uh, aircraft at, at Coast Guard a couple years ago, and I was really hoping because uh, part of the fun, the rising tide floats all boats. So what's good for the Coast Guard itself, which is good for Air Force guys itself, which but uh, apparently that, that never came to pass. Uh, about 250 search and rescue missions uh, per year out of that particular station. Okay, getting back to some of our uh, some of our ships. This was a uh, uh, just love. Love this photo. This was the only side wheel uh, ship that was assigned uh, to the Revenue Cutter Service in Detroit. Uh, showed up in 1883. Uh, basically, this was law enforcement function uh, on primarily the eastern half of the uh, of the Great Lakes. Uh, and, and basically, what they would do uh, at that time is they would they would kind of muster up a crew for the summer. And then they would come in when it got to be like this out there, and they would come in and essentially lay everybody off. And you either came back the next year or they got a new crew the next year because you know if you found another job, that's just how it works. So, so the concept of government service was a lot different, uh, at least uh, on the Great Lakes in, uh, in that time. Also included here, I, I, I think this is just fascinating, uh, that after the ship was done on the Great Lakes, uh, in 1903, it got sent down to the Florida Keys where uh, it, it protected the, uh, the sponge industry, which I didn't even know that was a thing, but it was in charge of the sponge industry, so good job, USS President. Um, a couple of uh, light ships. So there was two light ships that served on the, on the Great Lakes. Uh, one was the St. Clair. Uh, one of the things about the uh, light ships was uh, sometimes they changed their names depending on where they were assigned. Um, and, and it was the same ship, if everything was the same on it, they would just paint a different name on the side. Uh, so the St. Clair, uh, which uh, operated, out of, uh, operated out of Detroit, sometimes was known as the Gross Point when it was more by, um, oh, what's the point that comes out of uh, Gross Point there? The, uh, oh, there's a point that comes out of the water. That it would stay off the off the edge of. Uh, basically, uh, they would anchor, uh, stay in place, and would uh, essentially be a floating uh, lighthouse. And it had a kind of semi-permanent crew. I think there were times actually when there was no crew on board. Uh, but usually, there was one or two people on board that would you know keep the light burning and that kind of thing. Um, and then the one on the uh, the lower one there is the one that's tied up in uh, in Port Huron as a museum ship now. It was known as either the Huron or the Relief. Uh, depending on where it was at at the time. Uh, decommissioned in 1970, and it's the only uh, light ship that's still on the Great Lakes. Uh, I think for a couple bucks you can walk through it. Quarter. Okay, uh, this, is, uh, this is the Walnut. This is kind of our first uh, modern Coast Guard vessel that came onto the Great Lakes. It was on Detroit in uh, 1939, and then when World War uh, II really got going, it got sent out to the West Coast. It was actually uh, assigned to Pearl Harbor when the, during the Japanese attack in 1941, uh, but it was on uh, it was at Midway Island during the uh, during the Pearl Harbor attack, uh, and was conducting uh, search and rescue operations because uh, there were attacks that took place uh, throughout the Pacific um, at that same time. Uh, continued in government service until 1982 and it was sold to the Navy of Honduras. So, and uh, it's since been uh, scrapped. But, uh, the next, uh, one of the next ships to arrive was the original Hollyhock, uh, 1937 to 1959. 
uh, on the Great Lakes, on the upper Great Lakes, um, working out of um, uh, Charlevoix and also, I want to say, St. Agnes. Uh, arrived in Detroit in 1959, uh, worked here for a couple of years, um, then was sent down to, uh, sent down to Florida, uh, worked in the Caribbean, uh, was out in the, uh, was out in the uh, Caribbean looking for uh, problems with space shots. Uh, we were shooting off in Cape Canaveral. Uh, never had to uh, fish anybody out of the water for that, but it was part of that uh, emergency crew, or emergency response team, if there was a problem during the launch of uh, back when we were shooting off Mercury's and uh, Apollo uh, aircraft. Uh, and then sunk in Florida in 1982. And then this is uh, the current namesake of the uh, uh, Hollyhock. Uh, uh, been operating in Port here on since 2004, um, and we placed the brand over there. So. Okay, and then this is uh, this is the brand It was actually here in Detroit for uh, for about 12 years, um, and then was up in um, in uh, uh, Port Huron. This ship has pretty interesting uh, pretty interesting history. In the middle 1940s, it was um, observing atomic testing. Uh, at the Bikini Atoll out in the Pacific, so they were shooting bombs off on the Bikini uh, Atoll. Um, and basically what they did with this particular ship was they got it as close as they could to see what effect uh, a nuclear or an atomic blast would have on a ship. Um, okay, <laughs> I don't know how much testing needs to be done for that. Um, but and then what they would do is, is they would you know uh, hose off the deck or have sprinklers running during the bomb blast these kind of things to see what what were the procedures that they could do to try and wash off the radiation. I'm sure there's a uh, I'm sure there's a bunch of sailors that are getting you know $24 a month in compensation for the government for staying on the deck during uh, during this blast. Um, and then in the late 1950s, uh, this is one of the ships, the uh, Bramble. Uh, when this was decommissioned, there was a lot of uh, uh, I'll say controversy amongst certain uh, crowds over whether or not this ship should be saved or what should happen with this with the ship when it was decommissioned because of its uh, history going through the Northwest Passage. So the Bramble and two other ships uh, made the passage through the Northwest Passage, which uh, basically means they left from Alaska and came out near Greenland, uh, going through the uh, uh, between Canada and the North Pole. <coughs> Um, so in the 1950s, they became the first uh, first ships known to do that. Um, and then, as I said, operated here in Detroit for a while, was up in Port Huron for a number of years, and now is a museum ship in Port Huron. Um, when it was first decommissioned, if my memory serves right, it briefly was privately held um, by an individual, and uh, as mentioned, there was some uh, a little bit of controversy over who should own that ship, uh, whether or not it truly is a national treasure. Uh, the problem with national treasures is, you know, there's always so much money to go around to take care of all of our national treasures. But now it's owned by a nonprofit group that operates it um, up there with the uh, with the Huron, and there's another ship up there too that you can walk through. Uh, okay, uh, this is uh, this is the uh, Bristol Bay. As mentioned, it's one of uh, only two ships that have. Um, had a special barge attached uh, to take care of uh, navigation. Um, kind of an interesting little sideline, and some of you guys that are in the auxiliary might have been part of this, but when the Super Bowl was in Detroit, uh, gosh, what's that, it'd be 10 years ago now or so, uh, this ship was the command post for um, all the Homeland uh, Security operation uh, that took place. Uh, they had it tied up to the dock, there were a whole lot of uh, uh, people with stars uh, that were walking around there were in charge there. Um, uh, had the uh, really kind of neat opportunity to go out uh, in my uh, Air Force job. For some reason, we went out there that uh, one day and uh, took some uh, photographs <coughs> of, of how that was all set up. They were, I think, kind of super secret where the admiral was sitting or something. I don't know. But, um, but it was the command center for all the Homeland Security stuff, so pretty cool. Um, actually, during um, Super Bowl, there were extra extra um, attack uh, fighter interceptor aircraft that were uh, sitting out at Selfridge. So in case somebody was trying to bomb uh, Super Bowl, we were going to go intercept them. So there was a, a pretty major uh, effort, and I can only imagine that that effort has grown in the 
here since then. Um, so uh, I said it's pretty much a presentation about Detroit, but we can't talk about the uh, Coast Guard out of the Great Lakes without mentioning uh, the Mackinac. This is uh, the old Mackinac, uh, built in 1944. Um, really, really built, uh, very much built with World War II in mind. Um, the ship um, has a very uh, military um, feel, configuration on the bridge, in my humble opinion. Um, was built for, uh, to accommodate a crew of about 175, 180. Um, I know by the time it was done, it was uh, operating with a crew of about uh, 70 or 80, so there was a lot of empty seats uh, on the ship. Um, a couple of years ago, a couple of years before it retired, I managed to talk my way onto it as a, uh, as a photographer uh, to uh, document one of their last years on the Great Lakes um, and rode on the, uh, on the icebreaker from uh, Cleveland up to uh, I think I got off of Sheboygan, um, and I had a, uh, uh, I, I call it my own stateroom, but it basically I was in a, in a forward burning area with like 20 empty bunk beds and myself. That's where all the old crew had, had sit. And, and I think my, my bunk bed was like right there. So, no, actually I think it was there. So as we were, as we were breaking ice in the middle of the night, I said, I said, okay, well, I might as well go and get a cup of coffee because uh, this is clearly not happening tonight. So, um, it, was, it, was, yeah, it, was, it was quite the operation. And, uh, you know, I, uh, it was the first time I'd ever had an experience like that. And uh, they closed up, uh, closed up the, the, the area. And I didn't think I'd be in this big, huge room all by myself. Mm -hmm. I'll tell you something, it's dark. Uh, <laughs> And they close oh, all too, yeah, yeah. That, wasn't, that wasn't too bad, but uh, yeah. So um, and this and this guy really was just an old uh, old Smash Mouth football. I mean, that uh, really operated ten thousand horsepower, and so just really kind of back it up and smash it in the ice. That was that was his uh, his mo. Uh, replaced uh, replaced a number of years ago by this guy. This is the uh, this is the new. Uh, Mac and all, and thanks to uh, 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 Selena there and her husband, I, I managed to uh, talk my way onto this this past summer. Um, pretty smooth talker, apparently. Um, this this ship is really, um, again, this is kind of an outsider's uh, view of it. Really designed more as a uh, with a commercial purpose in mind. So the the, the bridge is not designed like uh, on the bridge of the old Mackinac. I thought, you know, like uh, Robert Mitchum or somebody would be in uniform and, you know, be coming up and, uh, you know, have a helmet on and, and uh, tell me what was going on. Uh, this, this ship, uh, much better designed for uh, beyond the bridge, a complete 360 view of everything that's happening around it. Um, much more multifunctional, um, is, able to, uh, is able to really do all sorts of missions in addition to breaking ice. Uh, the old Mackinac. Uh, was really good at breaking ice, and that was about it. Um, whereas the new one can, uh, you know, pull uh, buoys out of water and you know, do all those kind of things. A uh, little bit of a uh, uh, difference here between between the two ships. Um, you can see the old one's about 50 feet longer, uh, about the same uh, about the same speed, and you can see. This was what, what the ship had at the end, so about 75 uh, people assigned. Um, and as I said, that, that was uh, uh, going along with about 100 empty bunks. Uh, this one down to about 55 people assigned. So, you know, the, you know, the modern way we can do more with, uh, with fewer people. And uh, now that operates. Okay. Um, that is really about the extent of my uh, presentation. Just a quick overview on some of the ships that I've operated here. Um, <clears throat> a little bit about what the Coast Guard does in Detroit, uh, has done in the past. And I will take questions, but, but you folks, uh, I got a bad feeling you folks know more than I do, so. <laughs> questions, comments? And where, where's that one? Where's the next one now? Um, the, the current one is based out of Sheboygan, uh, that's its home station, and the old one is a museum ship that, uh, you know, you know, cost you five bucks or whatever you want it, 
But it's right. Um, Mackinac City. Yeah, the Mackinac Bridge is like right. It's right there. Um, basically, just just east of the Mackinac Bridge. It's really kind of a. It's really kind of a nice uh, nice picture at night because they got it all lit up and everything. So. Yeah. And it was uh, you know if you ever get up there, especially if you're kind of a, you know a boat nerd, it's, it it was worth the five bucks or whatever they charge you to go on it. I mean they. They really had it uh, set up pretty well, so you could really see see how it worked. Any other questions? All right. Well, thank you for coming out on this uh, snowy day. I've got uh, some uh, local local books by a great local author uh, here that make a great stocking stuffer. Uh, if you're interested in doing that, thank you very much. Thank you for coming. If you have time, enjoy the museum. Uh, check out the gift shop and yeah. drive safely on your way home. Yes. Um, I had a little uh, brought my tickets all here. Yeah.